Hello and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 219. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, listeners, as well as members and Moonshots family. Boy, do we have an action-packed, uh, sadly, conclusion, Mike, to our current product discovery series. I mean, it's been a very illuminating and enjoyable ride so far, hasn't it? Certainly has, and we are by no means uh, ending on a soft note. We are bringing it home with a great inventor and a great designer, aren't we? Blimey, this man, I suppose, has probably influenced or at least created a product that almost every single one of us, the likelihood is, Mike, all of us have encountered and seen in our lives. And that is Tony Fidel and his book, Build, an Unorthodox Guide to Making Things Worth Making. Now, Tony was uh, and still is a 30-year-plus expert, entrepreneur, product uh, discoverer, as well as customer-focused uh, creator, Mike. And he is not only somebody who created some of the best products that we know, such as you know, this little thing that maybe we've encountered before, the iPod, but he's also uh, since then gone on to create the Nest Learning Thermostat. Uh, according to Malcolm Gladwell, a classic Moonshots individual, Tony Fidel has made more cool stuff than almost anyone else in the history of Silicon Valley and in Build. He tells us how. And I think that's a great little introduction, isn't it, Mike, into what I think we're going to discover today in our show 219 on Tony Fidel's build. How do we go out and build products worth making? Absolutely. And just to think, you had me at, he created the iPod with Steve Jobs. Like, <laughs> done. But, no. Oh, yeah, then throw in the Nest thermostat. And do you remember mm. what a revolution that was when it first hit the scene? It really... It really changed the game. Like, who would have thought that your thermostat and your smart home appliance could actually look nice and work well too? Heaven forbid. And we get to study the creator of that, Tony Fidel. We get to go on a journey into what it takes to go from an idea to a product, working on yourself and on the team, working on your product and the business. And I just think we're going to really get into what I think is a fun, he's a very direct, straightforward kind of character. He tells you how it is. And I think there's so much to learn for anyone who wants to have a customer focus, for anyone who wants to bring the team along for the ride on what is certainly one of the greatest and most challenging adventures of it all, building a product and building a business. Those things are damn hard and we're going to learn from a master today, aren't we? Mm. Yeah, you're totally right. And I think one of the words that you've just used there is fun. I think there's a really nice characteristic of Tony that we're going to encounter in all of our clips today, where you get a sense of his um, joy in creating something worth making. And that's a great reminder to all of us as we try and go out and make products and, and validate directions to go in. It's all about having fun. So Mike, without further ado, rather than you and I reveal all of the insights from Tony, why don't we kick off straight away with Tony Fidel introducing you and I and our listeners to his book, Build, as well as what he thinks that we should all take from the book. And over the last 30 plus years, I've seen what humans need to reach their potential, to disrupt what needs disrupting, to forge their own unorthodox path. So I'm here to write about a leadership style that I've seen win time and time again, about how my mentors and Steve Jobs did it, about how I do it, about being a troublemaker, a shit stirrer. This isn't the only way to make something worth making, but it's my way. And it's not for everyone. I'm not going to be preaching progressive, modern organizational theory. I'm not going to tell you to work two days a week and retire early. The world is full of mediocre, middle-of-the-road companies creating mediocre, middle-of-the-road crap. But I've spent my entire life chasing after the products and people that strive for excellence. I've been incredibly lucky to learn from the best, from bold, passionate people who made a dent in the world. I believe everyone should have that chance. That's why I wrote this book. Everybody trying to do something meaningful needs and deserves to have a mentor and coach 
someone who's seen it and done it and can hopefully help you through the toughest moments in your career. A good mentor won't hand you the answers, but they will try to help you see your problem from a new perspective. They'll loan you some of their hard-fought advice so you can discover your own solution. And it's not just tech entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley who deserve some help. This book is for anyone who wants to create something new, who is chasing excellence, who doesn't want to waste their precious time on this precious planet. I'm going to talk a lot about building a great product. But a product doesn't have to be a piece of technology. It can be anything you make, a service, a store. It could be a new kind of recycling plant. And even if you're not ready to make anything yet, this advice is still meant for you. Sometimes the first step is just figuring out what you want to do. Getting a job you're excited about. Building the person you want to become. Or building a team that you can build anything with. This book isn't trying to be a biography. I'm not dead yet. It's a mentor in a box. It's an advice encyclopedia. If you're old enough to remember a time before Wikipedia, you might recall the joy of the literal wall of encyclopedias on your bookshelf or your grandparents' study or deep inside the bowels of the library. You'd go to it if you had a specific question. But once in a while, you'd also just open it up and start reading. A for aardvark. You'd follow along and see where you ended up, reading straight through or hopping around, discovering little snapshots of the world. That's how you should think of this book. You can listen straight through from beginning to end. You can poke around to find the advice and stories that are most interesting or useful in your current career crisis. Because there's always a crisis, either personally, organizationally, or competitively. You can follow the See Also links sprinkled throughout the book, just like you'd click through on Wikipedia. Dig deeper into any topic and see where it takes you. Most business books have one basic thesis that they spend 300 pages expanding on. If you're looking for a range of good advice on various topics, you might need to read 40 books, skimming endlessly to find the occasional nugget of useful information. So for this book, I just collected the nuggets. Each chapter has advice and stories informed by the jobs, mentors, coaches, managers, and peers I've had, and the countless mistakes I've made. Since this is my advice based on my experience, this book roughly follows my career. We go from my first job out of college and end up where I am now. Every step, every failure, taught me something. Life didn't begin with the iPod. But this book isn't about me. Because I didn't make anything. I was just one of the people on the teams that made the iPod, iPhone, the Nest Learning Thermostat, and Nest Protect. There you go. The troublemaker is dishing it out. Tony Fidel <laughs> style, straight up and in your face. I love it. And I think you get a very discreet, very clear image that in order to face this enormous challenge, of making a successful product and business. He ain't messing around. He ain't going to tell you two days a week and retire as a millionaire. Mm. He's get, he's like a drill sergeant. He's like, this is going to be hard, so let's get to work. Yeah, you're totally right. He's calling out already the fact that uh, there's always going to be a crisis and that you will encounter countless mistakes. But at the end of the day, he's here to provide that little bit of guidance in his book you know as he's as he's calling out specifically you're not necessarily going to get answers to those crises or those mistakes and those problems that you're going to encounter in because everybody encounters mistakes slightly differently mm. don't they instead mm. and i think this is really speaking to the product discovery series as a whole what we're trying to uncover with the likes of Marty, as well as uh, Colin and Bill with Working Backwards, it's all about understanding that A, a product can be anything. It can be that service. Maybe it's a team. Maybe it's something else. But also it's just about staying the course and kind of taking note of those moments that do get a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe it's an uncomfortable conversation with a colleague, or maybe your product just doesn't sell right. And as we're going to hear from today, Mike, we're going to hear a couple of those, I suppose, moments of learning that Tony went on through this illustrious career. And I hope that we're going to end up being pretty inspired, but also 
uh, if the right word is reassured <laughs> that <laughs> the over that a, an iPod it takes time. And if you want to go out and create something as substantial as that, it's going to take a lot of effort. And let's just break down. Like we, you know, we we're talking about how tough it is to create a product, to create a business. Like really, the chance of success. Let's go statistical here for a second. You ready to geek out on the numbers, Mark? Oh, I'm here for the data. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> let's do the data. So you know, if you look at like most studies, like if you look at the the U.S. Bureau of Employment. Uh, they'll talk about, or Small Business Bureau, they'll talk about at least two in every 10 companies fail within the first year. At least half fail within five years. And in fact, greater, deeper studies that have been done on product launches showed that at least 75% of new products do not succeed. They fail. It is an incredibly hard thing to do. And if you just think about the chances of success, there's not a lot of things in life that you can start and say, Hey, roughly I got like a one in 10, maybe two in 10 chance of this actually working out. Like those are pretty low odds. So for me, Mark, this is the case for why we need a product series. This is why we need to study Marty Kagan or work backwards like Amazon or go into the world of Apple and Nest because it is so hard. And I think, you know, we probably suffer a little bit from underestimating what it really takes because as is the case, we, we see these over, so, so-called overnight successes. But what we've learned, Mark, on the Moonshots podcast is there is no such thing as an overnight (laughs) success, right? There's no such thing. If there's one thing that we have definitely learned, Mike, across 219 shows, 20 master series, it's that these things take time, they take effort. And the ones who do end up succeeding are the ones who put in the hard work. Like you say, there's no six pack abs in six days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I tell you what, there might be some folks with six pack abs and they're called the members of the Moonshot podcast. Those people are putting in the time and the effort. So Mark, I think it is only appropriate for us to tip the hat to our members. Look, I think these members, they've certainly got six pack brains at least. And that includes dan 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 Bob, John, Terry, Marjolin, Ken, Dietmar, Marjan, Connor, Lisa, Sid, Mr. Bonjour, Paul, Berg, Kalman, and David are annual members. Again, week on week, Mike, that list is getting longer and longer. Now, the good news is right hot on their heels as always is Joe, Crystal, Ivo, and Christian, Samuela, Kelly, Barbara, and Andre, Matthew, Eric, Abby, and Chris, Deborah, Lasse, Steve, Craig, Daniel, Andrew, Ravi, and Yvette. Karen, Raul, PJ, and Nikuara, Ola and Ingram, Dirk, Emily, Harry, Karthik, Venkata, Marco, and Sundus, Jet, Pablo, Roger, Steph, Gabia, Anna, Raw, Nimalen, as well as James. Nimalen and James are our brand new members, but also a great call out to Nimalen, who sent us a fantastic uh, review, as well as a piece of advice, Mike, over the last couple of weeks, didn't they? It sounded like uh, he should be doing his own Moonshots uh, podcast. He was uh, so on to the productivity thing. So big thumbs up to Nimelin and to all of you members for supporting us and helping us on our long journey to be the best version of ourselves. And we turn our eyes towards one of the greatest challenges that of building a product and building potentially a business down the track. So let's return to Tony now. Let's see what happens when we go to the beginning. It starts with an idea. And in Nest, it took almost a whole year before we started the company. The way that it first started was, well, how might I think I could solve this problem technically? So is it, do I have enough of the pieces? Do I know enough of the things and I said, yeah, I know that because I had enough experience yeah. on that. So you first had to research enough about what you think would be built in. 
Then after that, you started researching the market. So you have to remember when you're disrupting an industry, and if you have something dramatically different, if you have disruptive technology, then you can change a stagnated market. Yes. The way that I've seen it is that you, it's, you have to start with the idea, what are you changing, and you have to take bold steps in terms of making something and trying it. Now, you have to test. Lots of testing. So you would make something... And then you would go to, uh, you know, some of the industry leaders or some of the people you really trust who are knowledgeable about a given area. And you'd say, what do you think? What do you think? And then you start to, to set your risk level based on how big the market is. I think the way the world changes is not by people being safe, but by challenging expectations, challenging the conventional wisdom. And if you want to change the world, you need to get out of the, 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 the area of safety. You want to get out of the area of safety, Mike, and start to challenge conventional wisdom. I mean, the key thing that I'm hearing from um, that great insight into how Tony Fidel would approach the uh, creation and development and discovery of a brand new product is the admission of what are you changing? Hmm. And I love this idea of uh, build and that unorthodox way, as Tony would put it, of making products worth creating is understanding or identifying what it is that you're changing and, and why that matters. Why mm. is this something much like the Nest thermostat or the iPod? Why are these things going to be successes? Why are they going to be something that customers, you know, get out of bed for and, and are intrigued at and research and even purchase? and stay loyal to that brand. I think it really comes down to that big insight, doesn't it? What are you changing and why is it the customers really care? And I think Tony yes. did a great job with both of those particular products in identifying where that gap is in the, let's call it the status quo mm. of, of uh, products that were currently in the market and how he wanted to go out and change them. What are you, wh where are you getting inspired from Tony in that, in that second clip? I think the interesting thing that he was building on is the capacity to get a little bit uncomfortable, get away from safety in order to come with radical solutions. I think that's the real idea that you see in the iPod and the Nest thermostat. And I actually reflect on that. And I think that the greatest challenge we face in that early stage is in fact falling for the safer idea. The assumption and the wishful thinking, oh, that'll be cool, that'll work. But it's the challenge that Tony is giving us is can we come with something radical, unexpected, something that is breaking the norm, breaking the conventions? And I think, I wonder why, why do you think it's so hard to do that. Why do you think so few companies do that market? What is it in the moment that people often like make a guess or go for some mm. safe, wishful thinking? Why, do, why does that happen so often? I, my personal opinion is that in times of my own career, when I've perhaps chosen the simpler option, and as Tony said in that first clip, a product can be anything from a, a physical product, or a service, or but it's not it just, be. it's just not simple. It's, I think the key word is safe, isn't it? Sa safe, exactly. And I think in my career, the times when I've chosen an option that perhaps seems um, safer is because it's less energy, less energy, and therefore it's going to be a little bit less uncomfortable and assumed more successful. Now, obviously, as we saw from the effort that Tony puts into the iPod, which was pretty groundbreaking, Mike. I mean, mm, we were talking super. at a time of CD players, cassette players. Yeah, there were some MP3 um, devices out there at the time, but when it came out, it was it was that game changer, wasn't it? And clearly not the low hanging fruit, as you could call it. And I think the success of products when you put in the effort and do that hard work and go down that that uh, challenging the conventional wisdom or the status quo and not doing that safer route, it stands out because customers realize that's what I was looking for. That's what mm. I fancy. That's what it is that, that is going to make a difference in my life because the simpler, or sorry, the safer route is sometimes just the easier one, wouldn't you say? 
I would. And I think it's like, what could we do in order to avoid making choices that are too safe? And I think it is to remember how low our chances are of success. <laughs> I think yes. it's a big, a big wedge, a big slice of humility and go, chances are we're going to fail. And I think I'm just trying to put myself in that position right now. If you're like, well, we're only going to have one crack at this and it's going to be, who knows? I think if you start really looking objectively at the the chance of success and how much the odds are against you, that you might go, well, geez, we better really take a swing at this one because, uh, you know, this is going to be hard. I think especially when you enter into an existing category where there's totally, there's a lot of options already for customers and you really have to come with something that is distinct, that is new, that is unique because you got switching costs. Why would people switch? It's like, eh, that mm. looks a bit better, but I can't be bothered. I mean, you know, switching costs is, or the bias to the status quo, that is the reality. Mm. So you got to fight for their attention. You got to come with something different or otherwise why change? Why, why upgrade? Why switch? Why churn when you've already got a solution? Cause it just takes time and effort, doesn't it? Well, I mean, we've all experienced the onboarding costs that come oh with a new yeah. software, a new system. Let's say uh, you've joined a new company or um, the products that you've been using and the systems you've been using get updated, you know, whether it's an iPhone or whether it's Google Docs or Slack or, <laughs> or anything like that. Yeah. that. That learning curve can be challenging, can't it? And sometimes it's a little bit frustrating. You think, why am I doing this? And that switching cost, as you put it, it is substantial. And I would say that I've seen people look at that switching cost and think, ah, you know what? It's not worth it. I'm going to stay with what I've already got. I've already put in time to learn how to use this other product, this other system or service. So therefore, I don't want to have to go and do it. And you're right to make a case to customers and to say, this is why we're bringing it out. This is the proof that why it's going to work. Only then can customers maybe look at it and think, you know what? They've done the hard work. I think they might be right here. It looks attractive. It makes sense. It's going to work. The customer experience is great. It's going to be simple and safe. I think that is something that really, really blocks a lot of us when it comes to picking up a brand new innovative product. It's the idea that it's going to be harder than what I already have. And therefore, maybe it's not for me. And I think that's where Tony really cracks into, isn't it? Yeah. How good is this? I mean, we're really sort of getting into, we know that we're setting off on an incredibly challenging adventure and we need to have the courage to go for something brave, something a little bit more radical if we really want to make a dent in the universe. So there you are. We already have two big lessons from Tony Fidel and his book build, and we've got plenty more to come. I do want to point out that if you're enjoying listening to the show, you should be heading over to moonshots.io where you can become a member. And if you become a member, I mean, the perks for our members, I mean, they're off the charts, Mark. They get, wait for this, Mark, you become a member, right? You get an entire new additional Moonshots podcast. It's called the Master Series. You get that entire thing as part of your membership, as well as, as well as supporting us and helping us pay the bills, you get an entire separate podcast. That's pretty good. It's pretty cool, isn't it? And we've been doing those for nearly two years, Mike. So the library is actually pretty substantial. That's a brand new episode released every single month on topics where we do really deep and intense dives. So topics like motivation, first principles, teamwork and collaboration, habits, communication, entrepreneurship. That feels like a pretty good build on what we're uncovering with the product discovery series right now, but all the way through rapid prototyping opportunity costs, and even the idea of happiness or wealth creation. So there's a really broad range, Mike, that you, know, you and I and the Moonshots family dive into every single month that you our subscribers and members can get access to, but it's exclusive for you guys because we know that you are behind us helping keep the lights on for the Moonshot Show. And that's what we give back to you guys every single month. 
So if you want to sign up, head over to moonshots.io. There's all the goodness there. You can hit the members button. You can get all the show notes, the archive. Everything is there, and you'll be on the way to being the best version of yourself. And talking about that, well, you know what? Tony was talking with Lex the other day, and he's got some thoughts on that too. What does it take? It takes belief in yourself. That's the first thing. Belief that you can do it. Not, but... hopefully with mirrors or mentors around you or coaches around you to make sure you know you're not crazy. (laughs) It's a crazy smart idea, but you're not crazy and you're just working on something as a, like a a lone mad man or woman, Mm -hmm. you know, you have a great idea. And I, like I said, great ideas chase you. You can, in this world, there are so many people who have more ideas than they have time to implement. I used to be like that. I would like, oh my God, I have this idea, I have this idea. And you, know, you do, you try to do all of them, mm-hmm. but the best ideas are the ones that you can really focus on and you, you shut out all those other things and you bring them other ideas into the thing you're trying to do. So I try to run away from a great idea and then it stalks <laughs> me. Yeah. It hunts you down because you're like, ah, that's going to have this problem. I'm going to put it aside. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, a few days later, Oh, I think I know how to solve that problem. Or I talked to somebody and you just always kind of niggling around the edges of it. And then at some point it's like, it just becomes, it becomes like this black hole that just sucks you. And you're like, I can't think about anything else, but this, it's almost like a relationship in, in the world, right? You know, when you have it with a per you, you find your partner, mm-hmm. you know, you're like, Hmm, Hmm, Wade, Hmm, something. And then you're trying to like, and then all of a sudden it just, it comes together, right? It's so kind of like that. Ultimately achieve focus. See, I'm, I'm different. I just dive right in. I used to do that too. I used to dive right in. Yeah. But, but I learned that you need more time effective to run away from it. Run away from it. And so it chases you because it makes you think harder about that this, story. This is not dating advice. We're talking yeah, about yeah, startups. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but ultimately, so, so you have achieved focus. Uh, focus on it. Uh, but you also said to so believe in yourself. So it's not necessarily even the idea. It's the human that um, believe in the human being. You, you have to believe in you, yourself and the idea that you have, because if you don't have that belief, then you can't project that to other people to say, join the team. I think this is a huge insight, Mike. And it's one that I think speaks volumes outside of the, Um, the idea of just building something from scratch. Instead, what I think Tony's now leaning into and and revealing for us is that you need to work on yourself and actually have discipline with how you as uh, an entrepreneur or a product creator have when it comes to ideas. There's been plenty of times in my career when I look at the plate or the to-do list. And I think, oh, this is, this is fun. I've got loads to do. (laughs) Where do I start? And that is one of the trickiest, I think, questions that a lot of uh, product creators and entrepreneurs probably have. Where do I start? What do I focus on? And it comes back to this idea of prioritization, doesn't it? It's going to be hard for you to tackle everything. Instead, as Tony's calling out, Focus on the thing that keeps on coming back. And I love that new idea that I think I'm getting from Tony in that clip. Put it to one side. And if it keeps on coming back to you, if it keeps on percolating to the surface and, you know, let's say nudging you on the shoulder and, and, you know, it keeps on coming up in conversations. Hey, Mike, I've got this idea. Every week I tell you about it. That I think is where Tony's leaning us towards, isn't it? The ideas Mm. that are infectious and you can't get away from. Yeah, I think there's a couple of, kind of builds I can make there. One is you can't rush a good product, right? Mm. It takes time. It takes time to see and to witness the problem itself. That's why so many, you know, successful products were created by entrepreneurs who had the problem themselves and wanted a solution. If you look at how Richard Branson thinks about Virgin and how he created Virgin Airways, it was because he couldn't get the flights with BA and he was Mm -hmm. kind of frustrated with the experience with British Airways. Likewise, I I see because it is a long game, and this is something that's come up a lot on Moonshots, it requires David Goggins like resilience. Mm. And in order to fuel the resilience, 
I would propose to you, Mark, that you really need to have taken the time to see the problem that you want to solve, but also not only have a conviction in the problem that your users have, but to have conviction in yourself and what you are doing. Because if you have this, you will serve the user, but the other stakeholder that Fidel mentions is you'll be able to go out in the world and recruit amazing people to join your mission, mm. to get them on the bus with you because it's not a solo sport, it's a team sport. And so I think there's like a whole bunch in this, the resilience for the long term and the continued self belief that what you're doing is the right thing. So the question is, Mark, you know, we've talked a lot about resilience. We've talked a little bit less about reminding yourself of your purpose. So here's my question for you. Drum roll. How do you do that? How do you remind yourself? How do you work on yourself? How do you build yourself, Mark? How do you keep clear on the mission so that you can bring people around you to get things done in your work. How do you do it? The way that I try and do that, Mike, is through, like you say, it is discipline. It's very difficult to, I think, choose to onboard a team and get them around you rallying together towards a certain cause when you've got too many things on the go. I think you can't possibly... As uh, you know, Marty Kagan said in Inspired, you can't have a, a great product team unless you are designing products together and specifically focusing on solving problems together. Unless you've got that, what you end up doing is you've got too many directions, too many areas that you're trying to lean into. So for the thing for me is trying to create upfront a really solid strategy and single-minded vision that I think we can all rally behind and work towards accomplishing together. Because not only is that then setting me up for success, because I know what I'm telling other people, where I'm spending my time. Mm. It also Mm. then helps me say to my colleagues, uh, whether they're leadership or, or, or reports, then say, right, guys, this is what we're working on. This is how we are going to do it together. And this is how we can accomplish our goal ultimately. And focus on those KPIs that matter to that single idea. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the big thing, Mark. We've talked a lot about this being like a marathon and what you're sharing there is really important stuff. You've got to communicate, share, be an ambassador to the vision, what you're fighting Mm. for with this product, what the team is working on. But let's go into those cold, dark, lonely moments. It's <laughs> early in the morning or it's late at night and the little voice of self-doubt comes. How do you fight off? How do you remain tough and resilient when you're facing the self-doubt on your own? How do you build yourself? Oh, those, one, those moments are tough, Mike, particularly when you're reaching you know, a conclusion point of maybe a quarter or an end of year, or maybe you've got a deadline that's looming, that little self-doubt where you think, Am I, have I spent my time doing it correctly? Did the team believe in me? I think it really comes down to the advice that we've picked up along the way of not only the product discovery series, but some of their other Moonshots members. And that's having open, frank, direct conversations where you can gather feedback. That's one of the key things for me. I like to, but, I, but I, Mark, I think sometimes- but Mark, you're, you're, you're talking to the team again. I want you to go dark here. Go to those deep well of self-doubt. You're facing big challenge. How do you work on yourself by yourself? Because this is the moment, this moment where you're like, oh my God, we're not going to make it. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm doing the right thing. Oh damn, why am I even doing all of this? What do you do in those moments? You can't make any calls. It's dark in there and you got to get through. You got to find the light in the tunnel. How do you do that bit? When you're by yourself in the tunnel, the cave, the moment <laughs> of uh, despair, you know, you're on that low Yes. Uh, point of the hero's journey and everything. What do you gone. do? What Mike, do you do? What I, what I do is I write it down. I think it's the simplest, lowest hanging, and uh, 
barrier to entry that one can do when you're facing those dark moments. It's not picking up a bottle of wine. <laughs> it's not <laughs> anything like that. Instead, where I lean into, and this is, this is something I've done, uh, obviously uh, so listeners won't necessarily be surprised, but writing it down really helps me get out of those mm. anxieties. And to build on that, it's not just journaling that I'm necessarily referring to, even though journaling certainly helps me, but it's writing down the plan, the vision, but also my to-do list every single time that I, get, I feel that, that moment, those, you know, mm. those, those moments, those niggles, when you think, oh, I feel a little bit unsettled, maybe yes. it's in my stomach or maybe it's in the back of my head, either it's a voice or it's a physical uh, feeling that your body sort of uh, tells you, Hey Mike uh, or Mark, you know, you're not feeling quite yeah, well. Yeah. In those moments, I sit back. I, I wipe my whiteboard clean. I close the laptop, put the phone away. I say, what do I need to do? What is my focus, whether it's today or this week or this month? Because yeah. that, as soon as I do it, and I did this yesterday and before today's recording, I do it. And I sit back and I think, you know what? Just the act of getting out of my own head and putting it visually mm. helps me feel so much more relaxed. You can feel my, sh I can feel my shoulders even relaxing as I look back at my to-do list and think, you know what? That's not that bad. It's not as hard as I thought it would be. I now know the three or four items that I need to do. So now it's all about the strategy of doing those three or four things. I can do great, three or four things. <laughs> great, great suggestion. Like write it down, reaffirm the plan. That's all about taking control, isn't it? It's taking control of those moments when you feel uncomfortable, isn't it? Yeah. We've yeah. uncovered this uh, in the Moonshot show, but isn't it interesting, Mike, and you and I reflect on this, of course, outside of the show, how product discovery and these lessons that we've learned from Marty Kagan, Colin Breyer, as well as Tony Fidel, really speak into this idea of perseverance, resilience. Absolutely. And discipline. Discipline with and yourself. Yeah. And when you go into those really tough moments, there's a couple of other things to add to your list, which is a great start. I would say, f you know, this idea of your circle of influence or your circle of control, there will be things that you can reflect upon, even in the midst of some things not being on track, some challenges, problems, or as Tony Fidel, there's always a crisis. There will always be some things that are going well that you did mm. execute to plan. So I think it's very important to remind yourself, well, A and B might not be working out, but actually I did C and D really well. And that's on yeah. this project in this moment, on this product or business. I think that's a very important thing to do because you will never find that everything is going wrong. Because if you want to get a little bit... Uh, philosophical about it. If you're there and you're able to take a breath, then that's job done. <laughs> you know, yes, that's one exactly. thing you did well, right? If yeah. you took one step, you did that well. If you sent that email, even though it was like, Hey, there's a problem, at least you're starting to get onto it. Like being able to face not only the challenge, but also to recognize that not everything is going wrong because then that kind of stops you spinning out of control. Yes. I think there's another technique that we've discussed and that's what David Goggins calls the cookie jar. You need to have a list of your accomplishments that you can go back to. So when you're in your hour of need, when you are in the valley of darkness, have a list somewhere written out or in an app somewhere that you can easily call up to remind yourself of the successes that you personally have achieved, things you can own. Mm. I did this and it can be my one goes way back into uh, my time at high school and right up to things that have happened recently, which I consider successes that I've really achieved. And so when you look at that, it's a little reminder that, oh, hey, I actually did like hit the target on a bunch of stuff in my life. And it's also 
probably going to lead you to remember that it wasn't a straight line, that there were challenges along the way. And I think when we're in those moments of doubt and challenge and there's a crisis, remembering that, hey, well, there was a crisis on this other thing and that got solved, that is really essential if you want to kind of stop the rot and get things back on track. What do you think? Stop the rot. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of <laughs> like that as a phrase. I, I want to, I want to build and reflect, Mike, on on your your cookie jar list because I think you've revealed to me in in the description you just gave us the core um, value that I think I miss every time something right happens. And what I mean by that is when there's a success at work, maybe uh, a project is. Uh, gone live on time or regardless of when it went live, but it was successful. Reflecting on those moments is great as well as being able to say, I achieved this despite this particular challenge. So Mm -hmm. the app went live, even though we had X, Y, or Z problems and dating all the way back to high school, that must be a a pretty amazing list or cookie jar. And it's certainly something that I'm going to go out and build myself, actually, because this is a wonderful little treasure trove to dive into, as we know the value of mantras and so on. And obviously, I suppose the cookie jar concept is similar to what we were hearing from Matthew McConaughey with going back and revisiting his journals that he was keeping since being a kid in order to write green lights, because importantly, the challenges that you encounter are sometimes just as valuable as the successes that you see. And That's right. The va- That's right. And I, I love that idea that we're we're obviously from David Goggins with the cookie jar. It's giving you that power, that confidence when you're hitting rock bottom and you need that little mm-hmm. bit of resilience. When you mm-hmm. compare it with with Tony, I think you're totally right. That methodology of um, circle of control, uh, the cookie jar list. I think that would reinforce what Tony is saying to us around building yourself. You need to build yourself to be that, that, uh, uh, strong and not distracted when it comes to, um, concerns that you have, you know, Oh, I've got investors on the phone or we're not going to hit the uh, forecast that we had. Oh, I need to get rid of so-and-so all these things ladder up to making yourself feeling a bit uncomfortable, isn't it? But if you've got enough preparation in yourself, confidence, uh, discipline. You can stay the course with the priorities that you have and you know why you're creating that product or business, then it's going to make it a little bit easier, isn't it? You're going to feel more comfortable making those decisions in the long run. And when you have those tools, when you can build yourself, you can actually start to put your mind to even more use to build your business. So let's have a listen to what Tony Fadil has to say about that. Okay. So when did you first start to dream about building your own things, designing your own products, designing your own systems and software and hardware? Well, in high school, there was a company that, um, a friend of mine founded and I was the second employee. It was called quality computers. And it was a mail, mail order, mail order, because there's no e-commerce then. There was no internet again. <laughs> yeah. You either mailed in your little coupon and you said, this is what I wanted to order. Or you wrote in to get a catalog and delivered to, you You know, turnaround time. And this stuff was like, from the time you wanted to the time you bought it, it was maybe eight to 12 weeks. That was just the normal way of getting things. Um, so quality computers was a mail order um, uh, 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 for Apple II. And it was software and, and all kinds of accessories. So hardware accessories, so hardware, plug-in cards, joysticks, all this stuff. And what, um, we noticed was, um, there were accelerators or memory cards and to be able to use those cards, you had to actually go and change the software you use to access this new memory. So you literally have to go and you took the program that you had, let's say it was Apple works, which was like an early Microsoft office or something like that. And you had to literally change the code and you would install all these patches to then take advantage of the hardware. So what we started creating was software on top of it to do the automatic installation of all of these patches. Mm. So we made it much easier to take new hardware and then, 
and, and the existing software you have and expand it into this new world. So it was creating tools and the really great customer support. And we, we started getting a lot of orders because we had the software make it easier to install, to give them the superpower. And at the same time, um, uh, you know, they, they would be able to change their software and, and have a new world that wasn't existing from the companies that were creating the initial products. And so it was more of that. And then that happened with, uh, uh, hard drives. So I wrote a hard drive optimizer for the Apple II to like read because you could get really fragmented. So I wrote that piece of software and we sold that through the company along with the hard drives that we sold from third parties. So that all happened in 12th grade, uh, freshman year of college. So <laughs> you wrote a hard drive optimizer in 12th grade. For the you know, uh, yeah, it, between 12th and freshman year. Oh, what, what programming language do you remember? Is it assembly? Is it, it was, it? It, there were certain inner loops were assembly and other loops. Actually, there were really early Pascal, no C, um, um, C, C, uh, compilers. What was the motivation behind these? Is it to make people's lives easier? Is it to create a thing experience that is simpler and simpler and simpler? thereby more accessible to a larger number of people like what, or did you just like, like to tinker? <laughs> no, no, no. It was two things really. Cause one, we wanted to sell more hardware and software, right? Yes. So it was like, Oh, make it easier for the user. And then the other thing was because I was also manning the customer support line. <laughs> people would call and I go, this doesn't work. And I'm like, Oh, I got to go fix the hardware and software. Right. Yeah. Or I got to fix the software to make the hardware and the installation process better. So my whole world was out of box experience from when I was in high school. Because <laughs> I had to man the customer support line, pack the boxes and write some of the code while we were doing While well, Joe, Joe Gleason, who was the founder of Quality Computers, he was off doing the mark, the ads, placing the ads for the mail order, making sure we were running the credit cards. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it was two of us. And then it turned into a third. And then we hired another person from high school to like pack boxes so I could stay on the customer support line or doing the software. Right. And it was all in his parents' basement. Yeah. Right. <laughs> As you were scaling exponentially. <laughs> scaling. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Bootstrapping. Bootstrapping in the basement. Mike, I think the key uh, insight that I'm, I'm getting from Tony there as he's talking to Lex and it's one of the key lessons that really comes out of the book build around building your business is identifying, I think the uh, common problem or the common hiccup or the common frustration that customers have and then solving a problem that's worth solving. So understanding how to get into maybe your customer's mind. So in, in that example, you know, understanding the frustrations that customers are giving over customer support and then putting it into practice. I think this is a big um, call out here. And I think the call out is to keep it simple. You know, mm. what we're hearing from Tony here is I wanted to go into work. I mean, the 12th grade, for those who don't know, who aren't based in the US, I think you're about 17, 18. That's right. Is that right? Yep. And he's going in, he's just doing something, you know, he's obviously managing school and so on at the same time, I imagine, but it's, it's trying to do something that's just simple because that's ultimately what customers are really leaning in towards, isn't it? It is. And it, and it's a great reminder of how Real work on a product and a business is so not glamorous. It's so <laughs> not ivory tower. Yeah. It's like, and I tell you what, I reckon if you want a power tip, man, the customer support lines, yeah. emails and phone numbers, and you'll soon work out what customers need. And you can focus on that first rather than getting too carried away with your dreams of global expansion and whatnot. I think it was a very humbling reminder mm. that he learned his customer focus. He learned his kind of solution focus from answering those, those phone calls. Cause let's, let's be honest when you're prototyping or manning customer support line, if you hear the problem, you know, 99% of human beings in the world, we're like, well, we better solve that problem because, yes. you know, we've, we've built something that's not perfect. And what a great way to iteratively, slowly but surely build something that's a long lasting product and a long lasting business by focusing first on what the customers need solutions for. Focus there and the business will come. They will be loyal. They will recommend you, refer you. Those things will all happen if you focus on building something for them and not building something 
for yourself. But we ain't done with Tony Fidel, Mark. I think we got one more left. Why don't you set this one up to kind of bring us home, Mark? This one to bring us home is a huge insight from Tony, specifically around how there is no shortcut. There's no six pack abs overnight. And instead, what you need to go and do, you need to stay true and you need to look closer. One of my greatest teachers was my grandfather. He taught me all about the world. He taught me how things were built and how they were repaired, the tools and techniques necessary to make a successful project. I remember one story he told me about screws and about how you need to have the right screw for the right job. There are many different screws, wood screws, metal screws, anchors, concrete screws. The list went on and on. Our job is to make products that are easy to install for all of our customers themselves without professionals. So what did we do? I remembered that story that my grandfather told me. And so we thought, how many different screws could we put in the box? Was it going to be two, three, four, five? Because there's so many different wall types. So we thought about it. We optimized it. And we came up with two different, three different screws to put in the box. We thought that was going to solve the problem. But it turned out it didn't. So we shipped it, shipped the product, and people weren't having a great experience. So what did we do? We went back to the drawing board just instantly after we figured out we didn't get it right. And we designed a special screw, a custom screw, much to the chagrin of our investors. They were like, why are you spending so much time on a little screw? Get out there and sell more. And we said, we will sell more if we get this right. And it turned out we did. With that custom little screw, there was just one screw in the box. It was easy to mount and put on the wall. So if we focus on those tiny details, the ones we might or that we may not see, and we look at them and we say, are those important or, the, or, or is that the way we've always done it? Maybe there's a way to get rid of those. So my last piece of advice is to think younger. Every day I'm confronted with interesting questions for my three young kids. They come up with questions like, why can't cars fly around traffic? Or why don't my shoelaces have Velcro instead? Sometimes those questions are smart. My son came to me the other day and I asked him, hey, go run out to the mailbox and check it. He looked at me, puzzled, and said, why doesn't the mailbox just check itself and tell us when it has mail? I was like, that's a pretty good question. So they can ask tons of questions. And sometimes we find out we just don't have the right answers. We say, son, that's just the way the world works. So the more we're exposed to something, the more we get used to it. But kids haven't been around long enough to get used to those things. And so when they run into problems, they tr immediately try to solve them. And sometimes they find a better way. And that way really is better. So my advice, and that we take to heart, is to have young people on your team, or people with young minds. Because if you have those young minds, they cause everyone in the room to think younger. Picasso once said, every child is an artist. The problem is, is when he or she grows up, is how to remain an artist. We all saw the world more clearly when we saw it for the first time, before a lifetime of habits got in the way. Our challenge is to get back to there, to feel that frustration, to see those little details, to look broader, look closer, and to think younger, so we can stay beginners. It's not easy. It requires us pushing back against one of the most basic ways we make sense of the world. But if we do, we can do some pretty amazing things. For me, hopefully that's better product design. For you, that could mean something else, something powerful. Our challenge is to wake up each day and say, how can I experience the world better?
big question to bring it home, Mark. You did not disappoint, nor did Tony Fidel. He encouraged us to continue to embrace our childlike mind, to ask better questions, to challenge the status quo. It brings us full circle to why we've got to have radical solutions and just avoid the safe bet. Mark, there is no better way to finish a product (laughs) show, a product series than that kind of thinking. I have to ask you, after all these homework assignments you've been given by Tony Fidel, where (laughs) are you putting your mind towards? You know what? Today is a bit of a tricky one because I really appreciate the simplicity, so to speak, of starting with an idea that solves the customer problem. So right at the very beginning, you know, and what are we doing? What are we trying to solve? But at the same time, I really appreciated the direction that Tony took in the book with regards to building yourself, building yourself, working on yourself to become a success and therefore to help you know, yourself stay either diligent and disciplined and hold back that monkey mind, but mm. also be the good leader and, and build up a good team. So today, Mike, I think I'm, I'm going to have to lean towards the idea of building yourself first. Mm. What about you? Well, I'm, I'm going to say not only is that being a very powerful theme for this show, but for the entire series is that if you want to play in the product game, you're actually playing in the people game too. And they go hand in hand, right? That's true. That's true. And that's very much what we were seeing with Marty Kagan as well, wasn't it? The idea of getting those, as well as Jim Collins, getting the right people on the bus. It's, yep. it's an intrinsic um, and very important value, isn't it? It's, it's sort of an essential codependency. You, you, you're, you're always playing a team sport, even if you think you're just the inventor. I think what we've discovered on this series and with this show in particular, uh, that it's far from that. It's a team sport. So, Mark, I want to thank you. I want to thank our members and our listeners too for joining us here on show 219 with the book Build by Tony Fidel, the man behind the Nest thermostat and the iPod, to name a few products. And our lesson started with straight talk. He's going to be that mentor in a box. And he started us with come with a radical idea. Don't be safe. And if you want to do that, you need to build yourself first. You need to fight for a problem that's actually worth soldering figure that out and then you'll have a business and always always bring yourself back to fresh thinking almost a childlike mind so that you can continue to challenge the status quo and that is what we are definitely doing here we're challenging ourselves and the world around us here on the moonshots podcast we are desperately trying to be the very best version of ourselves and we're doing it together we're learning out loud because that's how we rock and roll here at the moonshots podcast that's a wrap